The first thing is, is uh, welcome to Trinity. It's an absolute pleasure to see you here. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about chemistry and what it's maybe a little bit, even if you don't become chemists, just a little bit of the reasons why I have 20 academic staff who have been pursuing chemistry for all their lives and I've managed to find it interesting for well over 30 years. And I have a low uh, boredom threshold, so there must be something that's keeping me going. So I'm going to explain that to you today. So just to get myself in the mood, because it's Christmas, <coughs> I'm just going to turn on my little fluorescent man. I make fluorescent materials for my research, so it's kind of nice to have a little fluorescent man keeping me company. And um, <coughs> I'm not sure if it's going to work, but see if it will warm up a little bit. Um, I have some quinine here, which is tonic water. And I don't know whether, can you see a purple glow here? So I'm just going to get myself in the mood. Ah, now I'm ready. OK. So the first thing to tell you a little bit about chemistry is that chemistry is all about atoms. And the currency of those atoms is electrons. And what makes chemistry happen is the exchange of electrons. A little, little bit like the human economy is driven by the exchange of money. Hopefully more than that. The chemists' uh, elements don't have consciences, so their currency is electrons. Now let me show you, this is my favorite bit of the entire lecture. These atoms are all packed as a solid, and you see how they are integrated as close together as possible, and all they can do is vibrate, like you sitting in the lecture theater. All you can do is this. And so this is a solid situation. And then if I eat a few of these atoms, which is not why this is my favorite bit of the lecture. You can see now I have something that can move. It is now a fluid. Now, if I could only eat them fast enough, this is a situation in a gas. And these little atoms, they move very, very quickly. And you can see that they can disperse and escape. So very small atoms, like hydrogen atoms or helium atoms, they escape from the rubber of the outside of a balloon. And eventually, it depresses and the balloon sinks. So let me tell you a little bit, if I haven't lost my, my screen, about chemistry. Oops, you won't see much. <clears throat> so my name is Sylvia Draper, and I'm the head of school of chemistry at the moment. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that later. But this is where chemistry takes us. We work both with computers and with materials and in laboratories. And we do things that are nanoscale, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 9 meter molecules, thinner than the human hair. And with those molecules, we have an impact on the environment and how we might make materials in the future that are more efficient, catalysts that awake um, um, latent properties that are asleep. Um, industrial chemistry, so the preparation of hair dyes, toothpaste, the nylon stockings that you're wearing, the cotton that is grown, which requires an awful lot of water for every kilogram of cotton that's made. You think it's environmentally friendly, but chemists can do better, and you can do better. You're the next future of chemistry. We'll look at some advanced materials, and we'll look at how chemistry, as drawn here, connects with your everyday life. And this area is how chemistry interacts with the body. Small molecules, actually, you're all living laboratories. And the chemicals inside your body are responsible for your thought processes, are responsible for the way in which you absorb and extract energy from your food. All of those are microscopic chemical reactions. And even your senses, even the way your eyes work, are thanks to a chemical in the brain, in the back of the eye, that responds to light. So you can't really live without experiencing chemistry. And <clears throat> I'll just show you that mankind, you know, we don't mark the development of mankind in terms of our ability to to talk to each other, 
We don't remember UG to language. What you, if you think back, we think of the Stone Age, we think of Bronze Age, we think of the Iron Age, we think of the Nuclear Age. What we're actually doing is marking the development of mankind in terms of their ability to do chemistry. And it was a major advance, chemical advance, that we could extract metals from the environment and create arrowheads and tips, that we could actually create armour. We, we then went on and developed things like gunpowder. Now, these are destructive forms of chemistry, but I'll talk to you a little bit about that again. So this is just one example. The first civilizations were in Greek, uh, Greek and Egyptian, and you can see that they learned to extract bright pigments from the materials around them, including magnesium, which gives the white background, the orange, which is arsenic sulfide, which gives the color of the, hum of the human form, and blue was the color of, of um, kings and later gold diggers. And we actually use blue to dye the, uh, the jeans that we wear, the denim that we wear. And just to show you, look, as far back as 32 BC, there was the need to actually write down a chemical process. If you actually want to make malachite, this lovely deep blue, this is how you do it. You take sand, you take natron, which is a, um, a natural material, uh, an ore, you rub them together, you turn them into a powder, you add copper, you add water, you roll them into balls, you put them in an oven, and then through the mutual exchange of vapors, a chemical reaction, you create a blue color. And so some of the first things that mankind felt the need to write down was a chemical reaction, a chemical process. Let me just show you a little bit, which is nice to demonstrate. <clears throat> if I'm right, and if chemicals um, their currency is electrons, then where their electrons are housed and how willing they are to give them up will have a bearing on their chemical character. And so, just as with human beings, the more generous you are with your time and with your money, it gives us something, some indication about your character. And so I'm going to do a couple of flame tests. And flame tests tell us a little bit about the character of metal materials inside these compounds. So I just have to, hopefully. So there's my simple camping gas. And maybe I could do with an assistant. What do you think? I think so. So Dr. Noel Scully is going to nobly help me find an assistant. So do you want to kind of walk up that aisle? And if anybody on the end wants to put their hand up, they can come and, oh, terrified. Oh, have we got anybody? Aha, great stuff. Good thing. So give her a round of applause. <laughs> and what she's going to do is she's going to take, so you have to, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a death trap. Um, yes, those ones are less scratched. And what we're going to do is, we'll move my phone, so. <laughs> is we're going to give you some, now this is lithium soaked in ethanol. Ethanol burns, and what I want you to do is just to spray it into the flame. Whoa, that red color is telling us something about the electrons that are kept in lithium. Lithium is very happy to lose electrons. It does it re relatively rapidly. And when the electrons jump, they jump back, release an energy, and the energy corresponds to red. And that is characteristic of lithium. So if you see a red flame, so if you had any lithium and you put it on the Christmas pudding and set it alight, the Christmas pudding would be red. Try this one. This is copper. We're expecting to see a different color, which we did. Woo! <coughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, what about this one? This is, you could do this. If you wanted a slightly salty Christmas pudding, if you added a bit of sodium chloride, table salt, whoa to the ethanol, that's for the color of the flame. So thank you very much. i got to let you sit down now for a second. And I need somebody else this time to burn magnesium. It's an experiment that's done in the leaving cert but I bet you it was demonstrated and you didn't get to do it. So who wants to come and burn some magnesium? Aha, we have, okay, this side this time. Well, we have a gentleman. Um, are you able to get out? That's it. And so, <clears throat> now magnesium burns with a different color flame altogether, characteristic of magnesium. We're going to put it in 
some tongs. Um, can you see without your glasses? Uh, yes. Or maybe, can you pop those on for me? Now, the thing about magnesium, what do you think, if you were making fireworks, what colours would you want to see? Would we put some potassium, make it lilac? Would we add in a bit of lithium, get that lovely red colour? Well, see what colour this gives you. There you are, now all you've got to do is hold the tongs. That's it. Put the end of the magnesium ribbon in there, and when it goes off, shh, which it, you put it in there, okay? I'll hold, hold it, hold it for a minute. Oh. <laughs> hold on. We'll do a second version. Pinch. Okay. So just hold it for a second or two so they get to see it. That's it. Hold it up. There we are. If you want a white firework, you know those very slow ones, those pretty ones? Perfect. That's it. Drop it in. Now, if I was to add water to this, the solution, magnesium, because it's an alkali metal, if I add water to this, that's, that would be an alkali, a basic solution. Brilliant stuff. Thank you very much. I'm making chemists as we speak. Okay. I don't think I need... I only need my flame for one other thing. Where else might you use those brightly colored metals? Any ideas? She says, holding up a packet of sparklers. <coughs> we could use that. I can't open it. I have to give it to Noelle, see if she can open it. And we might have a go at showing you what the sparklers look like in a minute. So I have, if we took these ideas, these materials are obviously burning rapidly because we've put them in ethanol. But if I was to take those ideas and make solids that I was to burn in a confined environment, if I took a solid, then, so what metal is here? Magnesium. Okay, I'm going to give it to Noelle. Right, supposing I was to make a solid and contain the solid and it wanted to react with the gas in the air and if I contained it, squished it, what would I squish it into? A bullet. How about that? I could shoot you because it would be compelled to rush out of the barrel of a gun and bang straight into you. Well, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to shoot anybody, although I'm... <laughs> and it's so sad that we have these safety precautions. But anyway, instead, we have made some gunpowder for you using <clears throat> Roger Baker's recipe from 1242. So I can't be responsible if it goes wrong. And um, I'm going to light some gunpowder for you. So it's a mixture. You can read what it's a mixture of. So it's got carbon. Carbon rapidly wants to turn into carbon dioxide. It's got sulfur. Sulfur rapidly wants to turn into sulfur oxide. So they're really desperate to react with the air. And when they do, they form a gaseous material. I might have to resort to, I don't really want to, let me see. Can I persuade it to light? I'm doing very well. Normally I have a taper and we forgot to bring a taper. I'm burning the wood. <laughs> no. Maybe, maybe I'll give you, maybe we should have used the sparkler. Yes. Great idea. Hold on a moment. Do you need a new sparkler? <clears throat> Aha, well done. Noel has the technology. Now, fortunately for you, I didn't compress the gunpowder into a tiny ball. And because I didn't, it didn't explode. <laughs> so, if it wasn't for chemistry, you and I probably wouldn't be here. And it was that knowledge of chemistry that allowed us to do things like create and extract poisons. So strychnine is a poison from a plant. And we extract, we can extract it by um, mashing the leaves in a small amount of water to create a paste. We can take that paste and we can put it on the end of a blowpipe. Blow because you mustn't suck. And when you blow, you would push that little tip out of the, essentially, a straw. And then using the eye of a tooth, a tooth of a very large ca carey or a kind of guinea pig, 
you can actually use it as a sight and you can accurately, accurately shoot your prey or your food up to 30 meters away. You need to be quite clever, don't you? Because if you've shot something that you want to eat, the poison mustn't be poisonous to you or me. So you need to use a dose that kills the prey but doesn't affect you when you come to eat it. You also need to use the right dose so that you're not chasing behind the monkey that you've shot for two miles. You want it to fall out of the tree fairly soon. Otherwise, you'd be so hungry by the time it fell out, you'd be ready to run up the tree yourself. So these kinds of things meant that mankind could get a decent supply of food, and that's why we are where we are today. And just to show you that strychnine, that's the plant that it comes from, has been used for other uses. You may have heard of strychnine. It is quite an effective poison, but unfortunately, if you decided to use it, it has a very, very bitter taste. So to disguise the taste, um, this nefarious villain, um, Thomas Griffiths Wainwright, he needed to get rid of all of his various relatives that were going to become heirs to this wonderful property that belonged to his wife's family. And so he poisoned them all, step by step by step. Um, you can see that um, his wife's youngest sister was first poisoned with antimony, and then she was fed strychnine, but to cover the, the taste was given to her in jelly. So look out for jellies and apple pies. They are a very, very good disguiser of taste. <laughs> now, chemistry is also dramatic. Who's seen Breaking Bad? Oh, lots of people. So I thought I would show you a bit of the chemistry of Breaking Bad. OK. Um, to do this, all I actually need to do is open a Christmas cracker because the bang inside the Christmas cracker is a small amount of silver fulminite. And if you remember, Walt used mercury fulminite to blow up a building and kill the drug dealer behind it. And the mercury fulminite looked like little tiny crystals like this. And it's made by reacting, by dissolving silver nitrate in ethanol. This is the formula for mercury fulminite. And you can see when it reacts, as usual, you create lots and lots of gases, carbon monoxide and nitrogen are gases. And so it's an explosive reaction. Silver fulminite is even more reactive. Why? I know, because I'm a chemist. You need to do chemistry in Trinity to find out why silver fulminite is more reactive than mercury. Ha ha ha. So, silver fulminite is what's used inside a cracker to give it a bang. Then, he also uses the thermite reaction to break some locks. And the thermite reaction is a very, very energetic reaction. It's not explosive because it's not producing gases. But it's very, very energetic. And what you do is you pick two metals that have very, very different reactivity, and you put them together. And when I told you that the currency of chemistry is electrons, this reaction is all about the iron losing, um, the, uh, the aluminium losing its electrons. The aluminium, all metals like to lose electrons. Metals conduct electricity. Of course, they like to lose electrons. But the aluminium wants to lose its electrons and become this. And the poor old iron loses the battle, and therefore it has to gain the electrons. And this reaction gives out so much energy that you can use it for welding. So you can weld um, the railings on, on, a, on a gate. You could use it to do tram lines and put them together. <clears throat> so he steals that reaction, does old Walt. Finally, the body in the bath. Hydrofluoric acid, yes. The f it's not that it's a very, very strong acid. It's that the fluoride has a very negative charge. Fluorine is like the Tyrannosaurus rex in the periodic table of all the elements. And it grabs electrons. And then what it does is it reacts very rapidly with silicon or calcium, which are the main contain contents of ceramics. So yes, hydrofluoric acid would melt a ceramic bath. It would melt your teeth, which is calcium apatite on the outside, the enamel. A little bit of fluoride instead of your hydroxides in the enamel makes your teeth a little bit more resistant to acidic attack. Interesting. But the amount of hydrofluoric acid that you would need to dispose of a body would be so much that actually Jesse should have been overcome by the fumes. So um, it's not 
quite accurate. And lastly, can you poison people with phosphine? Absolutely. But you need white phosphorus. White phosphorus, actually, each little part of white phosphorus looks like four little atoms arranged in a pyramid. So it has three atoms at the bottom and a fourth phosphorus atom at the top. So when you get your Ferry Rocher chocolates at Christmas, you can take four because you need to make a P4 molecule to show your parents white phosphorus, okay? So none of this taking one at a time business. So that's a phosphorus, P4, white phosphorus, very reactive, and it will react with hydrogen and water and steam to give PH3, which is indeed toxic. Red phosphorus takes a lot of persuasion, and it's red phosphorus that, just, that Walt uses. Now, if you arrange atoms in different ways, they get totally different properties. So these four atoms are exactly the same, but if I put them in a, in a layer like this, this layer will behave very differently to the four atoms collected together. And this is at the basis of something called catalysis. A catalysis is we're going to take a reaction. Often we use a metallic surface like this, and it speeds up the reaction. Can I give you an example? Yes. If you want to make meringues quickly, you should be using copper, uh, copper bowls. And if you go into any old, old, old laboratory, old kitchen, you'll find that they had all copper utensils. And that copper surface is very reactive, and it causes white, the white of the eggs, to whisk together to form that thickened meringue-like texture. How does it work? Well, <clears throat> this copper surface reacts only one specific side of the atoms. Now, it's not very efficient because as a copper, the surface, only about one in every eight, only about one in a billion atoms will actually hit the surface in a way which causes them to react more efficiently. So it's much better if you can bury your catalytic atom, not on, in a surface where you can't get at the underneath. You're wasting atomic reactivity. Much better if you can put the atom inside the reaction vessel. So how would you do that? Well, what you do is you take an atom, a reactive little metal atom, you block one side, like the cap of the Ferry Rocher, and the reactant materials react with this side, turn into the products. But then you have a problem. You've got the catalyst and the products mixed up together in solution. How do you get them apart? That's what's the great thing about a surface, because these atoms stay stuck. Reactants come in, react, make products, leave. So how do chemists, with their intuitous, ingenious little minds, how do they sort out this problem? Well, do you know what we do? We, we take our mixed material, and we think and think and think. And the solution is all in the mind. All you need to do is to fix the catalyst onto the surface of a porous material. Then the reactants can travel through the porous material, turn into products. You don't have to worry about separating. And you have um, actively used every single atom instead of having them buried in the surface. It's clever, isn't it? So every time you eat a Malteser, that is a typical honeycomb porous material on which you could fix a catalyst on the outside or on the inside of the honeycomb, and it can react with your reactants and leave your products which you can simply filter through. Are you convinced that metals are reactive? Maybe not, so I'm going to show you. This is um, a, using a tra transition electron microscope with a tiny, tiny little point. What you do is you pass the tip of this over a surface like this. And what it does is it sends a current from the tip through to the surface. And when it meets an atom, which is a source of electrons, you get a different signal than when it travels over a gap. So you can, you can effectively have a good look at the surface of a material. And this is oxygen reacting with a copper surface 
And when the oxygen hits the surface, it splits into oxygen atoms and goes off and does interesting things that single oxygen atoms can do. So that's why you keep trying to protect yourself from these reactive oxides. So you coat your skin with particularly UV absorbent materials which prevent oxygen from, um, from singlet oxygen from coming and attacking your skin. It helps to protect, create a barrier. So with chemistry and with other sciences, I always think of chemistry as being the meat inside a sandwich or if you're vegetarian, the interesting bit inside a sandwich. <laughs> and the bread, oh, that can be physics or geology or one of those. But the chemistry is the bit that, you, you know, you don't go up to somebody and say, I'd like a white sandwich. You say, can I have a tuna sandwich? You define the sandwich from the filling. So chemistry is like that. And with chemistry, we've been able to go from enormous machines to tiny little devices. And these surfaces contain materials that are liquid crystals, materials that conduct electricity, materials that can, can, can connect with the outside world. And if you do chemistry, you can go from what we used to do in an enormous laboratory to a reaction on a single, single tip of a, of a finger. Um, just to show you some of the things that are happening within the School of Chemistry as we speak. So our 20 academics, they are doing research. They are funded both from Europe and from the Irish government through Science Foundation Ireland and other grants authorities to do research. I'll just show you a couple of things. We've been working on materials that will interact with your DNA. Therefore, they can zip up your DNA and prevent your DNA from replicating if it's damaged. Here is my high-tech DNA model. <clears throat> at the moment, it hasn't got a twist. The DNA is right-handed twisted. It's like this. You have to design a particular material with a particular straight shape to intercalate between the base pairs of DNA. Interestingly, there are very few life forms with a left-handed twisted DNA which is a remarkable thing, but it means that we need to design materials that specifically target a right-handed chiral twist inside your body. Um, these materials, they do all sorts of things, like help to prevent damaged DNA from replicating. So I just need, um, also up there, is a picture of a fuel cell. There are people working on the reactive ingredients in the middle of a fuel cell, the job of a fuel cell is to convert, to split water into hydrogen and oxygen, and in that splitting reaction to create an alternative source of energy. And finally, we have on this slide a picture of nanomaterials, which means that you can make resistant coatings for paints, for buildings, smart materials that can coat glass, you're not supposed to have to wash glass anymore, which is kind of interesting. So I just try and capture a little bit of the chemistry that's going on and tell you about where I think you need to contribute in the future. We have a, a major crisis coming, and that crisis evolves around the fact that we're very reliant on oil and coal as our source of energy, heat, and materials. And we need to try and get out of our dependence on coal and into renewable sources of energy. And that might be using hydrogen as a fuel source and therefore fuel cells, or it might be that we use solar energy. Or, what, or we might resort to a natural product like elephant grass and break it down into the ethanol that we need to drive um, a combustion engine. So taking that idea, I have something called a methanol gun. Um, and I also, unconnected, have some liquid nitrogen, which is just a super demonstration. So I'm just going to put my, this is ordinary rubber tubing, bendy and flobbly. Um, that's a very unscientific way of describing it. And I'm just going to leave that soak while I do my methanol gun. Now, all I need is one volunteer who has a friend that they would like to shoot. Anybody like to put now? You're better to be the friend that comes down and fires the gun 
than the friend that remains in the lecture theatre. So, ah, excellent. Come on down. <coughs> what we're going to do is we're going to use methanol as our fuel. <coughs> it's the same as we would use in a little aeroplane. If you are a, um, a model aeroplane fanatic, we're going to put a cork in the top. We're going to put it in here. We're going to give you goggles, so you don't need them. It's actually out there that needs them, but never mind. <clears throat> and then, what I want you to do is I need you to line that up. Now, the idea is that the cork is going to fly out of this bottle, um, and it's going to hit whoever it is you want it to hit. So you might need to get down. looks a bit high at the moment. Oh, there he is. He's the man in the little grey hat, isn't he? Yeah. Yay! What do you reckon? I have to assure you that we've never successfully hit the person we were aiming to hit, ever. <laughs> in these. So actually, the people close by are more at risk. <coughs> so all... What you, God, he really doesn't like you. You reckon? Yeah. Probably. Okay, so what you're going to do, this is a Tesla gun. It's going to provide some um, energy. It's going to cause um, literally like a little lighting bolt from one uh, of these nails to the other. And in the process, it's going to make the methanol combust. The methanol will turn into a gas, and it will blow the cork out the top It's quite firmly. So it's going to go with quite a bang. And you just need to switch this on. And don't point it at me. This is the Tesla guns that they use, you know, if you've stepped out of line in America. What? I hope we cut that particular snip of the video. And so you just got to light it and touch one of the, not both at simultaneously, because that would be very interesting. <laughs> oh! No, uh, will we have another go? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Where were we? Were we too far to the. I didn't see it go off. To oh, be he shut his eyes, I think, at the critical moment. <laughs> we just have one more go. Okay. So do you want to have another go? Now you can realign. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, we're off. Go on then. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I hope to see you again sometime soon. Take care. <laughs>